This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show, and today I'm pleased to have John Taylor of Duran Duran on the show promoting his new book, In the Pleasure Groove, Love, Death, and Duran Duran. How you doing today, John? I'm good, I'm good, I'm a happy man. You've got this amazing book out. Thanks. What, what made you decide it was time? I lost my dad a couple of years ago, and I've, you know, that causes a lot of... Uh, you know, introspection, a lot of feelings of nostalgia. I sold the house that I grew up in. Uh, I guess I got, I've reached the age where I kind of felt, you know, it was a good time to sort of look back in a balanced way. Uh, I got to write about the 80s, which it seems as though, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen very often. There are not a lot of books out there that talk about the 80s, which particularly the early 80s, which I think was a really dynamic, really fun time for me. But, you know, for pop culture in general, I think it was an exciting time. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, and you know, the timing, the universe aligned. It just seemed like the right time to do it. Was it painful revisiting some of those memories? Well, it is painful. I mean, I, I, it is. But at the same time, you know, as I say, I think I've got enough, you know, balance today, I suppose, that I could, I could dip into it. I could look at it, but without getting, you know, sucked into it. Why does a man who is the idol of millions turn to drugs to suppress loneliness? Well... I think it's trying to be all things to all people, you know, and when you've got a lot of people around you and they all want you to be, you know, somewhat different, um, you know, then, you, then you, you have to expand on your resume, you know, and you start, you start using, you know, to give you self energy. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's also, a, it's a late night game, you know. So, you know, you're lo always looking for that, that extra lift after showtime, you know, so around about 11 o'clock, midnight, you're kind of looking to, you know, shift into overdrive, and that's when you start turning to stimulants. Did cocaine or drugs fuel the recording of the first two Duran Duran records? No, uh, not at all. Actually, that, that was one thing I did find right away, that it, it never, never helped me as a, as, a, as a player or as an artist. I mean, all logic went out of the window. I think that's why I liked it, because it was... You know, we were under a lot of pressure to deliver, you know, right right out of the gate. You know, we, we, we had to produce hits. And I think that um, getting high for me was turning off, you know. And But uh, no, it never, it never, we were never that kind of a band. And, and the music was never, uh, you know, created in, in that way. It was always, a, we've always worked in a fairly sober, sober way. So you, so there was a discipline to, this is time to work, this is time to play. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I was the bass player, you know, I am the bass player. And yeah. I learned quite early on, you know, like the bass, you tend to, you tend to get it recorded and you got quite, quite, quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, those first couple of albums, I mean, the bass, you know, on the Rio album, I probably cut the bass in maybe two, three days. <laughs> and then you've got a lot of time of hanging around while, you know, Simon cuts the vocals, Nick cuts the keyboards, and you've got a lot, you've got a lot of time on your hands. Time on your hands is... You know, that's what the devil, you know, that's what the devil likes. But musically and sonically, your bass playing on that album is legendary. And, and you don't know how many times people have tried to learn how to play Rio. I mean, now they can go on YouTube, but in the day, back in the day, forget it. How did you come up with those bass lines? Well, it's funny that you mention that because there was one song on the third album when we were putting the reunion tour together. There was one song on the third album that I really wanted to put into the show and I could not for the life of me figure out what it was. And I, 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 listening over and over to the, to, the, to the album, I couldn't figure out what I was playing and I, I must have mentioned it. I, I mentioned it some, in some public, you know, publicly. And right away this, this, this kid out there, this bass player, you know, put a, put a uh, tutorial together, on, posted it on YouTube, and then, and then mailed me the link. You know, hey John, this is it, I've figured it out for you. I was like the little bastard, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, I think when you're, you know, I came of age, late 70s, that's where I was really, that's when I started playing bass. My bass idols were Bernard from, from Chic. I mean, I loved his playing. Um, you know, George Murray, who played in Bowie's band on Station to Station and Low. I mean, he was, everything he played was funky. And, mm -hmm. um, I liked a lot of the disco. I mean, I liked disco music. You know, I was a punk, but I liked disco. And I liked disco for the, for the, for the sound of the bass lines. And I found I could sort of play uh, a rough approximation of uh, sort of disco bass. Funky punk, that's what we were calling it. How do you feel your definition of glamour has changed over the years? Hmm. Well, I suppose it's, you know, 
I don't know, really. I mean, I suppose you get caught up in money, don't you? You know, I, you know, like like the turn of the the turn of the decade. You know, t the end of the seventies. You know, Duran Duran. We were like, we were like part of this scene in Birmingham, the new romantic scene. You know, it, it was a very very glamorous scene. I mean, everybody put a lot into their appearance. Everybody thought a lot about their persona, their identity, but nobody had a pot to piss in. You know, I think you, you know, you come to America. You know, you start start moving up the social ladder. You know, as you get as you get success, and the, suddenly glamour becomes about money and wealth, um, and and that's you know that's the fallacy, I suppose, in a way that it that it that it that it doesn't have have to happen. I mean, right out, right here on on Hollywood Boulevard. I mean, actually, among in in in, in the sleaziest way, there's a tremendous glamour to you know to 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 the, to the sleaze. You know, actually, that's my favorite kind of glamour, quite honestly, you know. How would you define that? Well, I, I, I suppose it's a, it's, a, it's a sense of sense of uniqueness that one carries, you know, where, you do, where, where you're not, uh, you don't want to be one of the crowd. You know, you want to, you, you use, you're prepared to develop your identity to a point where you're not, you're not, you're not out of the cookie cutter, you know, you're, you know, and, and, and whatever it is, you use your taste to define yourself, to, which is style, I suppose. I mean, a lot of people that you know they couldn't care, they could care less about style. It's not important to them, you know. To them, good grades, important. You know what I mean? Uh, but you know, um, I think glamour is, is 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 driven by by those who do not want to look like anybody else, do not want to talk like anybody else, or think like anybody else. Speaking of glamour, how awesome is it for you to see your daughter Atlanta celebrated in the pages of Teen Vogue magazine? Yeah, she's a, she's a glamorous girl. Where is she? She should be here. Yeah, she's a she's got uh, she's got the look, and uh, and ev actually everything I was just describing is important to her. You know, if only grades were as important to her as a, as an interesting look were. Um, but uh, now she's out of school. It's it, that's okay. But uh, yeah, I mean she's. You know, a lot of the people around her, you know, like her mother, her stepmom, you know, we're kind of, we're kind of into the, we're into clothes, we're into, yeah. you know, so, so. Yeah, uh, your wife, Gela, uh, create, was co-creator of Juicy Couture, which is amazing. Yeah, and now she has a new line, Skye's Taylor, and she's like, she's, she's in it, doing it, you know, redefining it. And that's exciting to watch. Very, she's very inspiring to me. How do you stay monogamous? <laughs> Easily. I mean. You know, I, I've got too much at stake, you know, I find that, you know, the marriage, you know, now I've actually got one. It took me a long time, you know, to get to get to that place where 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 I had that, you know, and, and, and it was something that I wanted for its own sake. And now I've got it. I, I, I want to hold on to it. It's like a massing every day. You know, every day that you work through some bit of bullshit, you know, it's like money in the bank. It's like building up a bank account, which hopefully you'll cash in in later life when when nobody else is interested in you, you know, you've just got one person in your life, you know, and you're kind of, you know, and you're sworn to each other. I mean, that's the payoff, isn't it? Of That's the great investment of marriage, I suppose. But we have a great time together. And, um, you know, we're, we, we, we inspire each other. Um, and, you know, she's like my best friend, my best friend, a sister, you know, she's all things. What was your, you know, what was fascinating about Duran Duran's performance at Live Aid earlier in the day Power Station performed but it was almost like here you and Andy are these two rock and roll looking dudes that day and then you you know have Simon and Nick and Roger looking very dapper and very Roxy music-ish uh, how was that what was that experience like for you well I mean it was a high point for us in many ways but it was the point at which the band was the most divided and we just we'd kind of come to this point where where there were two houses you know there was Simon and Nick there was John and Andy and there was we really we 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 didn't we weren't really agreeing on the direction of the band and um, we just kind of limped into Philadelphia, really. We we kind of came back together. We, you know, and Andy and I were on the road with Power Station. Simon and Nick were working with Roger in Paris, and we kind of came back t together for that one day and gave that Live Aid performance. And then we then we fell apart, and 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 we weren't, you know, we we didn't get together again for 17, 18 years. One of the one of the things you've mentioned in the book is that, and Nick is a dear, beloved friend of yours from childhood, is that w what kind of drew a wedge between you and Nick was that Andy Taylor was easier to to play and do drugs with, and Nick was not having it. 
Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, relationships evolve over time, don't they? I mean, yeah, Nick and I started out, we were definitely the, you know, it was our ambition. We had a very shared vision. Uh, we're both very ambitious. And, and actually, it's come around in full circle. I mean, Nick is the most, he's the, still the most driven person I know. And, um, you know, he's, you know, he's the one that uh, cracks the whip, you know, on, on, on all of us. I mean, he's still, he's very, very creative. You know, I mean, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a pure artist. Everything he does, you know, he, he thinks in artistic terms. And uh, that's inspiring and frustrating to have around. But, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's, it's part of the great chemistry of, of the band. And, uh, you know, Andy's not with us anymore. But still, you know, the four of us that still remain, there's a very strong, very strong chemistry. It's all about chemistry. The book's all about chemistry. Mm -hmm. And then what made Tom Sykes the right man to co-write this book with you? Well, thank God. I mean, Tom, you know, I, I mentioned in my thanks to him, I mean, Tom held the flashlight steady when we went into the attic of my mind, you know, and he never let me get bogged down. You know, you, talk, you mentioned earlier, you know, how can you, how can you talk about this stuff without getting, you know, bogged down or however I forget however you put it but Tom never we never we never got stuck we never got hung up we kept moving we'd set ourselves a, we'd set ourselves a target I, I feel it's important when you when you do something like this I could see a dozen times throughout you know throughout the writing of the book where I could have got hung up I could have stayed in bed and not and not gone back to the page not gone back to work uh, and Tom just kept it moving you know and he's uh very uh, very upbeat guy and um, and we have a we have a very good understanding of each other and uh, I, I couldn't have imagined doing it with anybody else do they know it's Christmas what was that experience of because uh, it, it seems so epic when they show the, the video starts off and you guys are all arriving and I mean it's some of the most powerful players in British music at the yeah, time well it was it was an epic day no doubt I mean no none of us really knew we, we all love Bob, and it was the, our love for Bob, really, that got us there. I mean, Bob, you know, had had, he, he had been touched by the footage that he'd seen in Ethiopia, and he believed he could make a difference. And we, uh, we it was really, it was like, in a, in a way, it was like Bob's, it, it was just, it was Bob's thing. You know, we were like, you're doing Bob's thing? Yeah, we're going to go and do Bob's thing. And everybody, got, and, we all, and once we all got there, of course, this, you know, U2 and Spandau Ballet and, you know, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a who's who of British music at that time. And everybody was there and it was like, holy shit, you know. And, it, and, 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 and I think by seven o'clock I was back home that day and it was, it was, the TV was just filled with it, you know. And um, it, it, it was a major, created a major shift in the zeitgeist. You know, you know I, I, when people talk to me about the 80s, I said, well, you're talking about before Live Aid or after Live Aid? Because actually there was a change, and the second half of the decade was, char was, was, was characterized by what happened that day and what Bob Geldof, he was the alarm clock for everybody. You know, up until then it was a very different, it was a much more style-centered, you know, that was, the, you know, the early 80s was when designers, photography, much more art, art, artistic, glamorous, yeah, but but the second half of the eighties was like, hold on a second. It was it was like taking taking stock, looking around you. It became political, um, you know. And and that day was was the hinge, the AIDS scare. Mm. Well, how did that change the perspective of Duran Duran and your life personally? Well, I'm, I'm I mean I'm, you know I was grateful that we, you know that we, we, when we came out you know it, it it hadn't it hadn't arrived. I mean it really came down. Again, the second half of the of the decade. I mean, I guess that was another that was another uh, shadow that, that you know on the on the second half of the decade where things where things changed. And um, you know, I, I I mean, I wasn't really I never really I never really felt it that that deeply. You know, I didn't have. I mean, Nick had friends he lost. It's it's really been more recently than I've, I've watched documentaries, uh, you know, and I've seen how it, you know, that I've been like, wow, you know, I, I mean, I was I was a little bit, I was probably so, you know, I'd entered my narcissistic phase, you know, I think by the by the sort of late 80s, you know, and I wasn't really aware, I was so centered on my own, on my own bullshit, you know, I wasn't really aware of what, of who was hurting and in what way they were hurting, you know. What is the secret of staying sober? Well, it's a one day at a time program. You know, it's uh, it's um, 
I mean, everybody's got, you know, there's lots and lots of different ways to do it, you know. Uh, you know, I do it by the book. Um, and, you know, so far it's been, uh, you know, it's been a fantastic experience. It's been like a rebirth, really. I mean, I could, never would have seen that coming, you know. Never would have seen that on the horizon for me. But, um, but that was the, uh, you know, that was how it, how it unfolded. Would you be brave enough to give other people advice on staying sober? You know, it's, it, 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 I think the point of the, you know, in the book I talk about it, it, it just from the point of view of like, you know, this was my experience, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I think most people, you know, certainly most people in my milieu understand that there are options. I mean, we've all got, we've all got the family member that doesn't know how to turn off. We've all got the family member that drinks too much. We've all got the family member, you know, that, that is struggling, you know, with maybe, you know, too many pills or whatever, you know. Um, you know, there are, there are options. I mean, <laughs> you know, if I was to get political about it, when everybody, everybody's so obsessed with Medicare in this, in, in this country, I mean, to me, the biggest problem is too many people are on too many medications. You know, never mind that, you know. I mean, I was lucky to, to be introduced to a, to, a, to a spiritual program that doesn't cost, it cost me a dollar a day. You know, it's uh, it's 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 the best uh, best deal in town. So you are a spiritual man now, and you have a higher power. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Yes, yeah, yes, I would say that. And again, that's a that's a. Um, I, I think that's a that's something that runs throughout the book as well, because the book starts off, you know, and I'm you know, and I'm on my way to church with my mother, and my mother was a Catholicolic. Mm -hmm. She went to church every day, you know, but you know, and she took me along, but I never really got it, you know. But I think at my lowest ebb. In the mid 80s, you know, I could define that low ebb by being spiritually bereft. And I found, I, and I've gotten back in touch with the spirituality. Don't ask me to describe it. Don't ask me to, don't ask me to define it to anybody. But, but you know, I, yeah, I've, uh, I lead a spiritual life. Not, you know, not as, you know, I mean, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not a holy Joe, but, you know, I, 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 I try to be mindful. How would you define the word love? Well, it's an ever, for me, it's, um, it's an evolving concept. Um, I, I suppose it's when, when you can acknowledge, you know, the importance of someone, you know, and how, and what, and what they, you know, we're so self, I'm such a self-centered son of a bitch, you know, and sometimes I forget, you know, that, 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 every, that you know, the value of, of that which is outside of me, you know, but... And, and often it takes, you know, it takes moments of profundity for me to appreciate love. I think that it's that, you know, we feel it when we're watching that movie or when, or when, or so, you know, or somebody says something to us and we kind of like get that, that feeling, we kind of well up, you know, and we suddenly we feel, we feel close to somebody and we, we feel that, we feel, it's a feeling, love's a feeling, you know, it's, uh, but it's, but it's very, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's good. It's a good thing when it happens, you know, because most of the time we're buzzing around, you know, what can I get? Where's mine? What can I get? How can I get more? You know, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's an acknowledgement of, of, of the other. What's next for you? Um, well, I'm going to take a little time off because uh, everybody else has been on. A, the hiatus began for the band, you know, at the end of August. I've been, I've been working the book. So I'm looking forward to a little bit of time just just to kick around town and uh, make a nuisance of myself. And uh, then we're going to go back in the studio with Mark Ronson next, su next spring in London. So everybody's feeling good about that. I was really glad that I got to write the book at a, at a point in the band's career where we're all, the, you know, where we've had a really good, we've had a really good run. We've had a couple of good, really good years. So there's a very, you know, there's a very positive sense of the band. You get that very positive sense of the band's, you know, dynamic in the book. Um, you know, if I'd have written it at another time, it might have been a more negative portrayal. But it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, we've had a couple of good years with All You Need Is Now, and we're, look, we're looking forward to the next chapter. John Taylor, you are a wonderful, awesome guy. Thank you so much for your time on the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show with John Taylor, signing off. The Blaring Out Show.